Okay, good morning and uh, welcome. welcome to the annual uh, Gendel Seminar on the Middle East. It's my pleasure, it's our pleasure to have you here in Tel Aviv uh, University. Um, there, is, there is something with this seminar, when I come to think about it. Two years we had a wonderful, uh, a wonderful seminar with the participation of uh, Professor Rita Marabinovich and uh, then uh, Turkish ambassador to Israel, Namek Tan. And we spoke about uh, Israeli-Turkish friendship and look at what happened to Israeli-Turkish relations. And last year we emphasized how stable the Middle East is, uh, how stable the regimes uh, were. And indeed, for many years, you know, uh, we face uh, tremendous and serious challenges, but we always had Husni Mubarak to rely on and the Assad dynasty in the north and stable Arab regimes all over, but it's not the case uh, anymore. There is, I wouldn't say new, you know, we had the new Middle East uh, back in the 90s, but clearly the Middle East, the new Middle East is different. In what way? What does it mean for Israel and for Israel relations with uh, its Arab neighbors? What does it mean for the peace process? What does it mean for the Arab peoples? What does it mean for the West, for Iran? All those questions, well, we will try to address all those questions with uh, Professor Rita Marabinovich and Professor Uzi Rabia. I'm sure there is no need to introduce uh, uh, the participants of this uh, panel, and they will address uh, some of these uh, questions and uh, we would like to leave uh, some time for questions and answers because right now uh, I, uh, I, I believe this is the right thing uh, to do with a knowledge audience like uh, you who come here every year and uh, listen to us and know uh, something about uh, the Middle East. So we'll start with... Um, short, I would say, a uh, few short comments by each of the panelists, and then we'll move to uh, the other part, the questions and the answers. Uh, the first speaker uh, will be Professor Rita Marabinovich, former uh, president of Tel Aviv University, former ambassador to the United States, and uh, uh, former chief negotiator with the Syrian uh, during the Rabin era, but for me, he will always be my professor. So, Itamar, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Eyal. Good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to, uh, to see you here. Uh, I should also say, for many years at Tel Aviv University, I, I was the incumbent of the uh, Dina and Yota, Yona Ettinger Chair. Uh, Tommy, uh, Tamir Rudich, her daughter, is here, and uh, last year I passed on the chair to my former student, Eyal, who also became the Dean of Humanities. It's a wonderful feeling to see your students uh, doing well and to know that there's always a, a young, talented uh, generation moving forward to, uh, to lead the university. Um, when, I, uh, when I completed my, uh, my, my tenure in Washington, I wrote uh, two books. Uh, one of them was an account of my negotiations with Syria, and it, it had the title uh, The Brink of Peace, which conveyed the sense that we were close, but did not quite close the, the brink, uh, cross the brink. And the second was an overview of uh, Arab-Israeli relations, and its title was uh, Waging Peace, Israel and the Arabs, 1948-2000. I'm, I'm looking at Marlene, who sitting across to me and typed much of the, of the manuscript at the, at the time. In 2003, uh, there was time to, to do a, a new edition. It was published in paperback by Princeton University Press. And uh, a few months ago, I reached the conclusion that eight years have passed. Much, much has happened in Arab-Israeli relations, and, and I'm now completing a third edition of the book. Unfortunately, 
it's no longer going to carry the title Waging Peace. There is not much peace being waged. And the title has been changed to uh, The Lingering Conflict. So uh, in a small way, uh, the, the story of this book conveys the message that I'd like to, to convey, that uh, Arab-Israeli relations have deteriorated in, uh, uh, in, the past, in the past few years. Um, I know that there are many issues that uh, many of you would like to discuss, and Professor Abi and myself decided to try to be short in our opening remarks and to leave as much time as we can for discussion, response to your questions and, and comments. And I'd like to focus my opening remarks on the term Nakba. It uh, figured so prominently in the events of the last few days. You were here at a very interesting time. You, I'm sure you saw on your television screens Palestinians toppling the, the fence in the Golan Heights and penetrating the Druze village of Majar Shams. You saw Palestinians trying to storm the fence along the Israeli-Lebanese borders and similar instances in the Gaza Strip. There was a pro-Palestinian demonstration a few days ago in the famous Tahrir Square in Cairo, uh, where anti-Israeli pro-Palestinian slogans uh, or banners were hoisted with a demand of return. You open a, a newspaper wherever you live, be it London, Los Angeles, or Melbourne, and you see something like the Nakba narrative that, that has become prevalent internationally. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about this, this term Nakba. So Nakba, origin, Nakba in Arabic means disaster. And Nakba was the term coined early on in uh, 1949 at the end of, of the war, uh, our war of independence, by both Palestinians and Arabs uh, to designate what what happened to them? It was a disaster. Uh, a famous uh, Syrian Christian intellectual called Constantine Zureik wrote a book in Arabic called Mana and Akba, The Meaning of Disaster. And uh, the thesis of the book was that this was not just a happenstance. This disaster didn't come out of nowhere. It reflected the decay um, of Arab society. Because how else can you explain uh, the fact that seven countries could not defeat one small fledgling country. There was something wrong in Arab societies. And he said this is the meaning of disaster. The meaning of disaster is that we have to look at ourselves in the mirror, ask ourselves what is wrong with our societies, political systems, reform ourselves, and not be again in a position when, where one tiny fledgling country defeats basically the whole Arab world. Nineteen years later, in 1967, after the Six-Day War, the same Constantine Zoraik published another book called Mana Anakba Mujadadan, say uh, the meaning of disasters yet again. And this time in 1967, it was even worse because in 1948 you could say, oh, we, we had bad regimes, we had kings, we had rotten kings in Egypt and Iraq and other places. The British and the French, before they left, uh, destroyed our societies and systems. They left us in, in a very bad shape. We were in no shape to contend against the Zionists, uh, the Israelis, uh, the bridgehead of the West uh, uh, in, our, uh, in our midst. And later on, this term Nakba acquired further and further uh, meanings. And at this point in time, it has meaning on four levels, and I'd like to address all four of them. At the most basic level, Nakba is a term used by the Arab minority inside Israel. You have to realize that 20% of Israel's population, including the Arabs of East Jerusalem, today are Palestinians, Arabs. If, if we were to speak here 10, 15 years ago, we would designate them by the term Israeli Arabs. They now reject this term. So we are not Israeli Arabs. We are Palestinians who are citizens of a state called Israel, and um, <coughs> we are part and parcel of the Palestinian people, and we want the state of Israel to change its nature. It cannot be what you Jews call 
Jewish and democratic. It cannot be Jewish because it has 20%, a national minority of 20%, which the definition of the state must include us in some fashion. And it's, it's not democratic because we, the 20%, are not equal citizens. I mean, I'm not describing an objective situation. I'm conveying to you the message that comes out of them. Um, <clears throat> almost four years ago, between December 2006 and May 2007, several civic groups, NGOs and other groups of uh, uh, Arabs in Israel published four documents. Uh, they come under the title called The Vision Documents, in which they uh, have their own vision of, of their future. And that vision is not our vision. It's not the vision of uh, Israel as a Jewish democratic state that is tolerant and has a minority of 20% that have equal civic and political rights but have to accommodate themselves to the idea that they live in the uh, national state of the Jewish people. This is not the vision. The vision is that Israel as it is now should disappear, should either become part of a large binational state that would encompass all the Palestinians west of the Jordan, including the, what we call Israeli Arabs, but also the Palestinians of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and it would be a binational state, it would become a, a Palestine. Or the other alternative, there would be what we call a two-state solution. There would be a Palestinian state that would be purely Arab, called Palestine, and there would be a state called Israel, but Israel would not be the Israel of today, but would be what is known in, in Arabic jargon as a state for all its citizens. So it ceased to be a Jewish state. So these are the division the documents. Uh, they are not shared by every Arab who lives in Israel, but they are shared by the political leadership and by the intellectual leadership of the, uh, of the Arab minority. And in the, these, uh, these documents uh, are informed by... Um, by the Nakba, what, what they call the Nakba narrative. So the Nakba narrative is, is much more elaborate than just the idea that 1948 was a Nakba. Nakba narrative says Israel, by essence, by its own essence, from 1948, is an aggressive, expansionist entity. It uh, was imposed here in the middle of, of the Middle East by the West. Um, it, it then expanded again in 1967, it settles, it, it, uh, it does this and it does, it does that, and that entity needs to, be, uh, needs to be changed. This is not just the idea of the Nakba, this has become what I call the Nakba narrative. So these are the Israeli Arabs. It's a major problem, I, and I have to say that 20% of the population uh, reject the very essence and definition of the state. Now, of course, this, this, the same Nakba narrative is shared by the larger Palestinian community. Um, and on the Day of Independence, in 19, uh, on, on May 15 every year, when we celebrate uh, the Day of Independence, uh, the Palestinians mark, they don't celebrate, but they mark the Day of the Nakba. Sometimes... It's a, it's a more quiet day, and the Nakba is marked in a, in a quiet way, and sometimes it becomes more violent. You may or may not remember that, but in the year 2000, just a few months before the outbreak of what is called the Second Intifada, um, in September 2008, in May, uh, 2000, in May 2000, there were many violent outbursts that they, we know very well that they were instigated at the time by Yasser Arafat as a means of, of uh, pressure, a preparation for what he triggered later on as, uh, uh, as the Intifada. And, and this year, uh, we don't have to stretch uh, far, far back in our memory, just the, the last few days, as we indicated earlier, this became uh, an, an, important, uh, an important day where, uh, whereby Palestinians uh, in Gaza, uh, Lebanon, uh, and uh, as it turned out, on the Syrian-Israeli border, uh, not the Israeli Arabs, not Palestinians, um, tried to storm the fence 
and in a very graphic way um, demonstrate what they call the right of return. Uh, right of return, namely the right of every Palestinian refugee and the son and daughters and the grandchildren of every Palestinian refugee to return, not to the West Bank, not to Gaza, but to Israel proper, to Jaffa. And in that, uh, in that narrative, we are not sitting in Tel Aviv. We are sitting in a village called Sheikh Munis. And uh, the right of return, when fully implemented, means that this place becomes Sheikh Munis again. I don't have to elaborate on, on what it means for us and why this obviously has to be rejected by us every conceivable way. On a third level, the Nakba narrative has been adopted by Arab states beyond, uh, beyond the Palestinians. And I mentioned earlier that um, there were demonstrations uh, in Tahrir Square in Cairo, the place where the Egyptian democracy celebrated uh, with uh, the massive demonstrations that uh, brought down Hosni Mubarak just a few months ago. At the time, everybody here and elsewhere was impressed by the fact that there were no anti-Israeli and actually no anti-American banners in the demonstrations of the uh, Tahrir Square. The Egyptians who were demonstrating there were focused on their own government, on, on their own desire to see Mubarak and his regime go and replaced by a democratic regime. And we were all relieved that we were not at the center of the picture. Well, this was then. In, in the last few days, some of the more radical Islamists who are now in the forefront of Egyptian politics have gone to Tahrir Square with banners uh, depicting uh, Israel, Nakba, right of return, everything we don't like to, to hear. And of course, on the northern frontier, the, the, most, the call it the outburst of hundreds and thousands of Palestinians coming to the fence at the Golan Heights, and some of them successful in storming the fence and penetrating the village of Majah Shams. This did not happen spontaneously. This was organized by the regime uh, in an effort to divert attention from the, uh, from the efforts inside Syria to topple the regime. Finally, the international community, and this, this is a, a major issue. The Nakba narrative has been adopted by the academic community, by the intellectual community around the world. And, you know, make, uh, make a, a small but illustrative experiment. When you go back to your home cities, walk into, into the bookstore, a major bookstore on the university campus or another, book, an, an, another bookstore and look at the Middle East shelf. And look at sometimes what is the Israel-Palestine shelf and look at what you see. A book by one Ilan Pape called The Ethnic Cleansing of, uh, uh, of Palestine. And, uh, another, another book by uh, um, a woman called Nadia Abul Khaj, a professor at Columbia, called Facts on the Ground. Uh, how uh, Israel is trying to eliminate any trace of Muslim presence in, in, in Palestine, and so forth and so forth. Or just listen to CNN or, 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 to, or, or, to, the, or to, BBC, to BBC radio. That narrative has penetrated anywhere. And that, to me, may be the most dangerous because uh, there is a plan here. Uh, the plan is to delegitimize Israel, and to do it over time, to wait 10 or 15 years until demography does it work and there would be an, more or less an equal number of uh, Israelis and, uh, or Jews and Arabs west of the Jordan. And then to do a South Africa, that one man, one vote, uh, equal number. Israel is illegitimate by definition because we have adopted the Nakba narrative and Israel was born in, in sin. And therefore, the way to uh, rectify all of this uh, would be to create one state that would not necessarily no longer be a Jewish state. This is, this is the danger that we all have to, uh, uh, to focus on. What to do about it? Uh, to fight it academically, intellectually, in the media. But at the end of the day, the only way to fight it is to have an ongoing peace process. When you have a peace process, when, there is, when the world sees that there is a ray of hope, that this is not just going to fester 
but it's going in some positive direction, we're in much better shape. If you look back at the last 20 years, when there was a peace process going, our position was much better in, in the world. The fact that there has not been a peace process in the last two years has uh, exacerbated everything that I described to you before. So yesterday we, we heard uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu giving a speech. It was not everything that we wanted to hear, but there were some very positive elements in that speech. I hope that as he crosses the Atlantic and goes to Washington to meet with President Obama and then give a speech to a joint session of both houses of Congress, there would be even more, uh, more hopeful, more positive statements in, in that speech, and that could be the start of a new beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Itamar. And indeed, now we face the question whether there is a partner for peace, not only among Palestinians, but in the Arab world in large, in general. Uh, during the demonstrations in Cairo in general, you, we didn't hear uh, uh, anything about uh, Israel, but Israel was there, and the Israeli issue is coming back, uh, as we can see right now from the streets of uh, Egypt. And to address uh, these uh, recent developments in the Arab world, uh, the revolution that shaken the entire region, uh, I invite Professor Uzi Rabi, the director of the Moshe Dayan Center and the chair of the uh, Department of Middle Eastern Studies. You see here in the university there is still stability and uh, Uzi is holding two positions and doing it uh, in an excellent way. Uzi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eyal. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. I, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today and uh, to provide you uh, with some insights of what's going on in the Middle East, at least as we see that. Uh, and uh, the way we uh, should deal with the Middle East uh, in the 21st century is definitely uh, should be different. Some of the tools that we used to have while dealing or analyze the Middle East in the 20th century must be changed. And uh, of course, this, is, this should be in accordance with our understandings of what's going on in the Middle East these days. Now, the region is being swept by revolutions. We know that. It started in Tunisia and then Egypt and we are witnessing kind of a turmoil in Syria, Libya. Uh, we have uh, the same scenario in Yemen, uh, Bahrain, and uh, even states or monarchies like Saudi Arabia and Jordan are not immune. Uh, so what we thought, that what I thought should, would be very useful for that kind of presentation is again to, since we have to just keep brief and then we'll just leave some uh, room for Q's and A's, and maybe we could just delve into specific uh, uh, countries and states and uh, realities. But uh, I would say that uh, there are some uh, main questions to be asked, and the first of which would be, what is new? I mean, the new thing is not that rulers are being toppled down. This is something that we have seen throughout the 20th century. The new thing here is who the instigators are. During the 20th century, we had that in abundance. Army officers toppled down monarchies, replaced them. We had, of course, the 1979 Islamic Revolution in Iran, but this was instigated by clerics. What we got now is a totally different thing. Mubarak is being toppled has been toppled, Ben Ali in Tunisia. I think that uh, maybe the days of other rulers are numbered. I don't know if it is Bashar or uh, Muammar al-Qaddafi in Libya, but of course this dynamic is very dangerous for their politics of survival, so to speak. I think that uh, 
what we got here is kind of a new phenomenon with uh, people at large, the public, using the uh, what we call social networking sites, being organized by the Facebook and the Twitter and the new devices of the 21st century. And in the final analysis, the public was the main instigator while trying to understand who toppled down Husni Mubarak, Ben Ali, and others. So what we got here is a new situation where the formula of ruler-ruled relations is being changed. And much of the power is going to be shifted one way or the other to the public. And in the end of the day, throughout the 21st century, we'll have a totally different Middle East because rulers are not that strong as used uh, to be the case with uh, the 20th century Middle East. What is very interesting also is what we call the domino effect. We have talked a lot about that. And everybody knows that it is not going to stop here. It's not only Tunisia and Egypt. We do see what's going on in Libya, Syria, Yemen, maybe Bahrain. And it remains to be seen what is going to be or what will become with the monarchies, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and others, Morocco maybe. But we have to remind ourselves that even if there is a domino effect, then there is a domino effect. And states are being affected by what happened in Tunisia and Egypt. Still, each state should be analyzed in accordance with its own history, colors, and the dynamic in Syria and Libya, Saudi Arabia, is different from, I mean, it's totally different because each state should be, as I said before, analyzed in accordance with its uh, main attributes, characteristics, geography, multi or a demographic composition, history, the way the state perceives itself and its position in the region. So we can say that nobody is immune. I think that that is evident. And I guess that that goes also to uh, far away as to include Iran and Ahmadinejad, not only the Arab fold. But still, when we are dealing with states that are going through that kind of a process. We have to know that we should measure, measure it in accordance with the uh, characteristics of a certain state that we are dealing with. I think that another observation, which is becoming more and more evident, is that all these states that have been going through that kind of a revolutionary process, do not witness democracy. And it is something which is pretty typical to revolutions, even out of the Middle East. What we are witnessing now is a post-revolutionary stage where more often than not what we have is kind of a period of instability. And we do see and observe those people coming back to the Tahrir Square in Cairo and when they are being asked why are you here? Mubarak is no longer the leader. This is what you actually asked or demanded when you gathered in the Tahrir Square. And uh, I would quote uh, a guy called uh, Wael Ghanim, who could be uh, titled as the commander of the Facebook in Egypt, the guy who organized the youth in Tahrir Square. And when asked this kind of a question, he said, we are back in the square to make sure that the new leaders of Egypt 
do you realize that what we intended to get in the end of the day is a regime change, not a change in the regime. And we are not, we do not want to be left with Mubarakism without Mubarak. So it goes on and on. And it remains to be seen where we're going to stop or what we're going to we have in, in the end of the day. But basically a period of instability. We uh, had the opportunity to meet the, uh, <clears throat> the staff in the uh, embassy of uh, Egypt in Israel uh, two weeks ago. And one of the observations that the vice ambassador came up with while being asked on what's going on in Egypt, he just put it loud and clear. Everybody would like to have a party of his own. Everybody knows what Egypt should have. So scientifically put, if I may, we would say that Egypt is becoming an arena where many orientations and visions are, I mean, being brought in and there is kind of an ongoing struggle of all these visions of what Egypt should be or look like in the end of today. And we have many recipes. It's not only Muslim brothers. There are secularists, liberals, independent parties, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, Egypt is just one case study. Syria is totally different. And uh, I would like to just say some words about the way the United States and Europe are referring or are just uh, building up their policy in view of the changes in the Middle East. There is no one rhythm, so to speak, or kind of a consistent policy when it comes to the United States and Europe with regard to those revolutions in the Arab state. We have heard Mubarak should go. We have heard Gaddafi should go. And this was something that was heard and voiced by many statesmen in the States and in Europe. We haven't heard any one of them suggesting that Bashar should go. Which means that here in the Syrian case study we have something, kind of a different sort of policy which is being seen by the states and by Europe. And we have to ask ourselves what is the difference. Of course, this is not Libya. There is no oil here. On the other hand, Syria could be going through a process of dismemberment. Syria could be just broken up to pieces because this is how the state was being built up in the end of, in the beginning of the story, in the aftermath of the First World War. So this is what we are trying to say, each state with its own rhythm and characteristics. And I think that a lot is to be said, discussed, reason about the new Middle East, as we say. The United States is, not, is no more that strong in the region, or, or at least not that more, uh, I mean, influential, at least in the minds of the Arabs. And this is something that you could just have in the Arab press in abundance. States should change their formula as what would be the best thing in order to do your politics of survival. Mubarak actually had quite a clear recipe. Rely on the United States. Develop kind of a pro-Western policy. This would be kind of a guarantee for your politics of survival. Well, it is no more a guarantee. And you have to listen carefully to what the people say.
And this is why Egypt recently is changing its tone and policy, at least verbally or using a different terminology than was used by Mubarak. More attentive to Iran, more attentive to Hamas. A little bit hostile when it comes to Israel and the United States. So states are moving. The whole region is on the move. And we have to just uh, have that in mind. I, I would say also that one should not ignore kind of a process that we have seen recently, I mean in the, the recent two decades. Still, the Middle East in the 21st century is totally different from what we had in the 20th century in, in the sense of the coming to the fore of what we call the non-Arab actors. It is pretty obvious that the Arab states or the Arab fold is witnessing kind of, I won't say decline, but states that were used to be the main engine in the Middle East, Cairo, Damascus, are not that strong while dictating the rhythm of Middle Eastern politics. The non-Arab actors, Ankara and Tehran, are becoming more and more influential, strong, as to dictate the new rhythm in the Middle East. So, I mean, my bottom line would be, and this is what we are uh, offering our students and the Israeli public at large when uh, they are asking us, actually, what would be uh, the main thing that Israel should do, how we should analyze things, we always say, you have to delve into Middle Eastern history. And if you're going to do that, it would be better if you're going to do that in Tel Aviv University, of course. We are opening up our gates for many students who are uh, becoming kind of uh, students of Middle Eastern history uh, because we do believe that when you have kind of an understanding and knowledge of Middle Eastern history, when you know the languages, when you could, one way or the other, provide yourself with many insights of how the other would think in that or that, in that or so case, I think that uh, it, it is time for us to also uh, have kind of a second thought about the Middle East, reanalyze things, and make sure that some of the stuff that we use during the 20th century, which is not no more valid here, and we should just uh, develop some other tools, this is something that we are trying to do, and of course we are already in the 21st century, the era of revolutions, and a real geopolitical change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uzi. Uh, listening to you speaking about Syria, allow me to uh, make the following comment observation regarding Syria. Back in January, when uh, the days of Husni Mubarak were numbered, Bashar al-Assad gave a very interesting interview to Wall Street Journal, and he told them, well, you know, Syria is not Egypt. Here, it cannot happen. Because, well, the people do like me, my people, and because, well, you know, unlike Egypt, uh, Syria is in a state of war with uh, Israel. Uh, Syria does support the resistant movement, so-called resistant movement, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah. And, well, you are fully aware that unlike Egypt, our relations with the United States are extremely bad. And then look what happened. Uh, Syria was abandoned, actually, by Turkey, which was a close friend and a close ally of the Syrian regime during the last uh, year or two. Uh, Erdogan uh, decided probably that, well, you know, a Sunni option, even radical or moderate uh, Islamic groups which might take over Syria, well, this option, this alternative uh, maybe is better for Turkey than to have the uh, Syrian regime supported by uh, Iran. The Sunni radical groups which supported Syria in the past, arguing that, well, uh, this, is, uh, this was the only country that uh, gave a fight to Israel and to the United States. Well, abandoned it as well. Look at, you know, Hamas uh, uh, signing an agreement with, uh, with uh, Fatah against 
the background of uh, the current developments in Syria. Actually, Syria were, was left with two main supporters, Israel on the one hand and the United uh, States. Israel, that is, um, looking to maintain the status quo along the Syrian-Israeli border. We only uh, witnessed uh, yesterday or the day before, you know, uh, a serious incident which reminds us how quiet was the border for the last 30 uh, years, how stable Israeli-Syrian relations in regard to the Golan Heights were during the last uh, 30, 40 uh, years. So if Bashar keeps the border quiet, why should we uh, replace uh, it with an unknown uh, alternative? And then when we move to the United States, uh, well, uh, we heard uh, Hillary Clinton uh, defining Bashar as a reformer. And uh, we didn't hear, uh, we, we read some of the announcements made uh, by, by the White House, but we didn't hear uh, Obama uh, referring to the latest events in, uh, in Syria. By the way, uh, by the, way uh, the way Israel, the way the United States, look at the current events in Syria, it's probably the way the majority of the Syrian population look at the current events in uh, Syria, because for them, um, I, I would argue that there are two walls of fear uh, in uh, most of the countries of the Middle East. The, the one wall was, of course, uh, the fear of the security apparatuses and agency of the regime. It collapsed. We saw it in Egypt, we saw it in Tunisia, we saw it also in uh, Syria. People are not afraid anymore going out to the street to demonstrate against uh, the regime. But there is another wall of fear, fear of the unknown. What might happen to the country once the regime collapses? And Egypt is far away of Syria and Cairo is far away of Damascus. The Iraqi model is more relevant of a country uh, in which the regime collapsed, a strong and stable authoritarian regime collapsed in 2003 and then what were the results? Disintegration of the state, bloodshed, um, uh, bloody struggle between different ethnic and religious communities. The Iraqi model, the Iraqi reality is more relevant to Syria than the Egyptian reality. And that's, uh, this is something most people in Syria do know. And I think this, is, this might explain us why the protest against the regime is serious, it's significant, but it's still limited to the periphery. We don't see it. Uh, we don't see Maidan Tahrir second in, 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 in Damascus or other uh, Syrian cities. But, of course, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, the coming developments in the coming weeks will tell us more about where Syria is uh, heading. With that, uh, um, you are invited to make your comments or to ask questions, and we'll do our best to address these uh, questions. So the floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I do suggest we'll pick up some questions, and then we'll address Just them all, okay? Perhaps it's too simplistic a question, but where does Israel make, with whom does Israel now negotiate for peace? <laughs> okay, okay, that's great. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, if I can ask specifically about uh, Egypt. Firstly, thank you very much for wonderful presentations. But specifically about Egypt, um, it was initially, it seems, a uh, democratic uh, 
will on the part of the people that has toppled the regime. Uh, however, in the meantime, as uh, Professor Abramovich has indicated, there's already been uh, Islamist-type demonstrations in uh, Tahrir Square. And uh, it would seem that the Muslim Brotherhood is the strongest of the parties at the moment. And therefore, if there is a, a, de a so supposed dem democracy that takes over, it's likely to have an Islamist leaning. On the other hand, Islamist regimes tend to be repressive. And if there is an underlying democratic you know, desire on the part of the majority of the Egyptians, does that mean that ultimately an Islamist party such as Muslim Brotherhood may eventually lose uh, its power and, and really, therefore, does that mean ultimately that things might settle down in Egypt after a while? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. But if you can... Just very quickly, ah, another okay. simplistic question. Yeah, Sorry, okay. very quick. Um, in particular, Professor Rabinovich, is democracy self-defeating when we see this growth of a sub-community within Israel that's, as far as Israel's democracy is concerned, is, would be an anarchist? What's the, what's the model of democracy going to do for Israel's well-being? Yes, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, speakers for making this overall presentation, give us an idea of what's happening here. And secondly, I'd like to thank the Diane uh, Center for their emails. And there are so many interesting uh, documents that you send us every month. My question is... Those of you who do not get the emails, please approach Uzi and he will make sure that uh, once you are back, the emails will be waiting for you. Yes, please. <laughs> um, my question is... What's Israel's position in the overall peace talks, and who talks for Israel? If we go back, we had Rabin at Camp David. He made certain concessions. And then we had uh, recently Olmert, who made other concessions, concessions con uh, including concessions on Jerusalem. Yesterday, we had uh, Natayanu, who said that the blocks, will, the block settlements will remain, but the other settlements, well, we're not sure. But who talks for Israel today when Natayanu makes a statement which is only supported by one faction in his government? As soon as he makes that statement, the other faction contradicts him. So it's not clear what Israel's position is and who really talks for Israel today. Okay. Who else? Let's move to the other side of the... Yeah. Um, I wanted to know how do you feel about uh, the, I, the concept of the unilateral declaration of a Palestinian state okay. that is a de facto situation that will happen in September? Thank okay. You. Yes, please. In the Arab world, um, compromise is seen as a sign of weakness. Perhaps you can elaborate on that and how we can get around that. Okay, so, uh, yes, if the, yeah. But because I do feel that, you know, many of the questions have to do with the peace process and uh, the options Israel uh, and the alternatives Israel is facing, and, and, yeah. I have two questions. The first one is regarding Syria. Uh, what do you think will happen if Bashar Assad stays in power, being abandoned by Turkey and Tehran? Will he still be uh, an ally of Tehran after he stays in power? That's number one. Number two, regarding the United States' abandonment of Egypt, should Israel reconsider its total dependency on the United States and perhaps move to other areas in the world for... Uh, Okay. For whatever. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll make a stop. Okay. Last question for this round and then we'll... Yes. Please. Yes. Yeah. The first, um, maybe I'm a little cynical, but um, all this Facebook, you know, spontaneous demonstrations within a very short time, there was obvious there was a great deal of organization and money behind it. In the square, they had supplies, they had TV screens up, and, now, and then, of course, the in Libya, they have weapons. I'm sort of cynical about who really was organizing it, where the money comes from, and who's really behind it. And comparable to that, my second part of the question, 
what is going on in the Israeli street? Where is the Israeli population, especially like on a day like today, after we saw what's going on the gate, you know, on the borders, after Netanyahu's speech? I mean, is there anything in the Israeli street and the Israeli population that would give us some hope for divergent views of some kind of solution or change, especially according to some of the things that the panel said, especially what Tamar said, that unless we have a peace process and we have hope for peace process, then there is nothing that can move forward. Thank you. Okay, we'll make a stop here and I'll do invite Itamar to... Thank you. Before I uh, before I respond to some of some of the questions, I, something I neglected to say at the outset. But you know, the John Gandel Forum was uh, created by the late Hil Ben Svi, uh, for many years uh, represented the university in Australia. Was Mr. Australia at Tel Aviv University? Was obviously not the only thing Hil did for this university for many many years. The campus would not have looked the way it does without Hil. We all remember him fondly, and this, I think, is a proper occasion to, to remember Yechiel as well. <clears throat> um, now, there, there were a couple of questions at the outset, who do you talk to? Uh, right now, there are not too many candidates. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly, you're, you're not going to make, to make a deal with Bashar al-Assad. I'm not going to give the Golan Heights back to, to a tottering regime. I may not be there in, in a few weeks, so no one in his right mind would do that. Likewise, it's, it's very difficult to sign an agreement. Let us say that Prime Minister Olmert were here today and he would put on the table all the ideas that he put on the table um, in 2008 uh, to uh, Abu Mazen before he left power to which Abu Mazen did not reject, he just did not respond, respond to. Today it's not the same Abu Mazen. It's the, it's the Abu Mazen who just made an agreement with uh, Hamas, who may be willing to sacrifice Salam Fayyad, this uh, great uh, prime minister who has been building the Palestinian state uh, bottom-up. We've read for the last two years wonderful stories about how uh, Salam Fayyad, with this able men fighting corruption, trying to build uh, security apparatus and so forth and so forth in order to, to build the uh, uh, Palestinian state bottom up and in a very ironic way was telling us Israelis, you know, we've learned our lesson from you. This is how the Zionist enterprise was built in uh, pre-state Israel in the 20s and 30s and we are just doing the same thing. But he's a candidate for being fired because Hamas hates, uh, hates his guts. So, of course, I would not advise to any, any prime minister, or specifically Prime Minister Netanyahu, at this point, to sign away anything. At the same time, at the same time, this must not be a reason or a pretext for doing nothing because we are being tested by the world and we are suspected by the world that we don't want to move and that we are taking advantage of this situation in order to just stay put. So what, what needs to be done by the Israeli leadership is what Mr. Netanyahu began to do yesterday, is to say these are our principles. We are willing to make uh, an agreement based on, uh, uh, on such and such principles as Mr. Netanyahu began to do yesterday. Now, of course, the difficulty here is political because prime ministers do want to stay in power. They have a coalition, they have a party, they have a constituency. In this case, he also has a family. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, when you make concessions, uh, the way for a prime minister to make concessions and stay in power is to have to some, to, to something to show for. Uh, I worked with Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister Rabin. He made the agreement with uh, Yasser Arafat. It was not an easy decision for him. We made the, the huge concession of shaking the hand of 
a terrorist called Yasser Arafat and recognizing the PLO, but he also got back a recognition of the state of Israel as a Jewish Zionist state by Palestinian nationalism. So there was give and take. Um, if you just unilaterally announce that you are willing to withdraw from here and there and so forth and so forth, you are making the concessions, you pay the political price, and you have nothing to show for. So that is a, a political predicament that the Prime Minister needs to, uh, to overcome. It's a huge challenge. I don't, I don't belittle it. Um, but that, that is exactly the issue. The second point I'd like to emphasize is it's very important for Mr. Netanyahu to do something that he has not done in the past two years, that is to build a relationship of trust with the President of the United States. It has not happened. The two men do not like each other, do not trust each other, and this is not good. The, uh, again, I was fortunate to be present at the birth of a wonderful friendship between uh, Rabin and Clinton. And uh, Ariel Sharon and Ehud Olmert had uh, very good relationships with uh, George W. Bush. Israel enjoyed 16 years of two very friendly uh, presidents. We now have, I would say, an unfriendly president, but an, an indifferent president. Barack Obama comes from a different background, different generation. He's indifferent to Israel. And uh, between him and Netanyahu, there is, not good, there is not a good relationship. And I would say the first task of uh, the Prime Minister, because we are the dependent party, would be to share with President Obama his vision. To say, right now is not the right moment, but if the right moment comes and there is a partner on the other side, uh, I'm willing to go a long way, and I'm willing to do A, B, and C. This remains in the privacy of this room, but I'm sharing with you, the President of the United States, my, my, my own vision uh, for a peace settlement. So this is where you, this is where you begin. Now to, to the question of, that has been asked, what ha I think by Rita, what happens in, in September? It's better that it doesn't happen. Because if it happens, our po diplomatic position is, is going to be exacerbated in a major way. But as they say in uh, colloquial language, you don't stop something with nothing. So for, uh, for the United States and Western European countries to mobilize against this, uh, this idea, you have to provide them with something. You have to persuade them that, uh, that you do have a peace plan, that you want to implement it, that you do want to, to negotiate with a worthy Palestinian partner when, when there is one, and, and then you get them, uh, you get them to, uh, to fight against that uh, resolution or to minimize its uh, ramifications if it does, uh, 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 if it does happen. Uh, with regard to uh, Egypt or democracy in general, you know, there's been a, a big mistake in, in Western countries in recent years equating democracy with free elections. Yes, free elections are a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. Um, the slogan in, 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 in many Muslim countries is, one man, one vote, once. They say, if you, have, if you have free elections in most Muslim countries today, unfortunately, Islamist countries, Islamist parties are going to win. And there will not be a second free election after that. So in order to have a democracy, you need to have free elections. You also need to have a civil society, a middle class, respect for human rights, respect for the rule of law, all the elements that we will live, happily live in democratic countries have in our blood. We know that these are elements of our life. These are not familiar elements in the life of people who live in Middle Eastern or other, uh, other non-free uh, non countries. So. What is happening is, let's say, in, in the case of Egypt, in the next few months there will have to be two elections for the president and for parliament. The candidates for president, not a great list. Amru Musa, the leading candidate, used to be the foreign minister, used to be the secretary general of the Arab League, very anti-Israeli, sort of a, an old school uh, Arab nationalist. Mr. Baradai, who was to be the head of the atomic energy in, in Vienna, played a destructive role in turning blind eyes to what the Iranians have been building in, in their own uh, uh, nuclear reactors. 
uh, made some very unfortunate statements in recent weeks. I don't, I, I don't see a great president in the making in Egypt. There will be an elections for parliament. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood is going to do, or other Islamist parties are going to do well and have at least 30, 40 percent of the seats. Um, <clears throat> so, and then there are the reformists who continue to exert pressure. So what we'll get in Egypt a few months down the road uh, would be four elements. Uh, the president, the new president, the new parliament and the cabinet that will be formed uh, responsive to that parliament, the, the young liberal reformist groups, and of course the army behind the scenes uh, underwriting the system. So there would be a complex interplay among these four elements. It's not a recipe for stability or for anything good uh, to come, uh, uh, come out of that. Um, <coughs> question, in the, Arab, in the Arab world, compromise is seen as weakness. Everywhere. In, uh, in this country, too. If uh, Netanyahu uh, offers uh, concessions and compromise, he will be vilified by people to his right, uh, the settlers and, and other right, right-wing elements. But uh, there is not going to be an agreement without mutual concessions and compromise. You know, one of the advantages of WikiLeaks is that we know uh, what the Palestinians were willing to offer to Mr. Olmert. Everybody speaks about what Mr. Olmert put on the table, but the Palestinians who spoke to him also put quite a bit on the table, and they were actually embarrassed when somebody leaked uh, the details of what the Palestinians were, were willing to, to do, and he, he leaked it to Al Jazeera, and uh, Abu Mazen and his people were quite embarrassed by the extent to which they were going to meet Mr. Olmert halfway, including practically giving up on the right of return. They did not sign on the bottom line, on the dotted line, but uh, they, were, they were also willing to, uh, uh, to make compromises. So in diplomacy, yes, every concession compromise meets with criticism, but at the end of the day, if there is an agreement based on mutual uh, concessions and compromise, uh, then the agreement speaks for, uh, for itself. Uh, the question on Bashar and Syria, maybe you would ask uh, Professor Zissa to, uh, to respond to. The question of uh, can we trust the United States after the United States having abandoned Mubarak in this fashion? Uh, the bottom line, or if I have to give a one word answer, the answer is no. Um, <clears throat> say, if, if we want to guarantee our survival, uh, we have to, to rely on our own strength. Um, we have what we call the nuclear ambiguity. Um, this is the ultimate guarantor of our existence. Unfortunately, there are efforts to erode that as well. And uh, President Obama has also made some concessions uh, to uh, Egypt and to others who do not like what, what we have. Uh, earlier presidents, uh, Bush, Clinton, it began with uh, in the days of uh, Johnson. Uh, just as an aside, I should say, President Kennedy, who is this glamorous president, was not a great friend of Israel, he was very critical of the nuclear program and gave the late David Ben-Gurion a very hard time over the Mona. But uh, later in the 60s, President Johnson and after him, Nixon and others accepted, accepted what we have and actually saw it as a form of relief. If Israel has this ultimate guarantee of its existence, the United States will not have to intervene in the event of a, uh, of a calamity. Um, now Obama is not a great foreign policy president. He made, not just with regard to us, several mistakes. The way Egypt or Mubarak were abandoned overnight after being very loyal and effective allies for 31 years left a very bad impression in the whole region. The Saudis, Saudis primarily, uh, were incensed by this, and when there were problems in neighboring Bahrain, they did not hesitate and send their own troops. They said, you cannot trust the Americans, you have to look after yourself. Uh, yeah. The United States caused itself great damage by, uh, 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 by this. Now, uh, finally, Tamar, uh, Tamar's question about Israel. I think you see that uh, Israeli society too has been, been affected by the by the vision or by the view of uh, people taking charge 
or the trade defying governments. There was a protest about the price of oil, uh, gasoline in this, uh, uh, in, uh, in this country. Um, there's now pressure with regard to the price of housing uh, in this country. People are inspired by all of this. And with regard to, uh, uh, to the uh, Middle East issues, there's now any number of, uh, of groups that, that are organizing, preparing plans, signing petitions. There is an awakening uh, in the society itself, feeling that if the political system doesn't do what it needs to do, then civil society needs to, uh, to move forward. Definitely, I see signs of that. Thank you. Okay, I'll keep brief just on top of what was said by Professor Rabinovich. I mean, um, yes, I mean, there was kind of a question about the uh, Muslim brothers in Egypt. Uh, well, the forthcoming elections for the parliament, what we do think is that the uh, Muslim brothers are going to have 30, 35 percent of the seats. This would uh, make them kind of a strong force in the Egyptian politics and they would have a saying of course would have a say what I think is most important here is to view the Muslim brothers in Egypt in a different way I think that this is just a more uh, sophisticated policy that is being launched by the Muslim brothers in Egypt it is kind of a gradual uh, taking control over uh, you know, economic sites, uh, education, indoctrination, but it is a, a gradual march, a step-by-step -step policy. And I don't think that they would like to jump and become the rulers of Egypt, so it would take time, if at all, before the Muslim brothers are becoming the rulers of Egypt. But basically, I agree. And this is something that is being asked by, uh, I mean, in many editorials in the Arab press, where are we heading to? And there are two options, basically, if we could just have that generalization uh, and can use that. Are we heading toward 1979? Or maybe it is 1989. 1989 is the democratization process as was evinced in East Europe. 1979 is the Islamic Revolution in Tehran. But this is not kind of a new thing. This is a question which is being asked in the modern history of the Middle East. Where are we heading? What comes first? Religion or state? And this is kind of a, a very tense meeting and very, uh, I would say, uh, problematic juncture when religion and state should meet together and kind of uh, produce kind of a formula where both could coexist. It is not that simple. This is not a new story. And even in the new era of these Arab revolutions, this state is being asked, and I think it is very important to just have that in mind because we're going to have that in the future. Uh, the other thing is that, I mean, I just stick to one, one question that was asked uh, you said and what this Facebook, Twitter stuff is. And you said that, uh, I don't think we should be cynical on that. And I tell you why. I'll tell you why. First of all, thanks God we have this Twitter and Facebook. I know nothing about that, but we have a bunch of researchers, young researchers, who know how to deal with that. And we get a lot of information of what's going on in the Arab fold, in Iran, in Turkey, thanks to those new devices, so to speak. But what you asked actually reminded me what Butrus Rali and all the Egyptian statesmen said when those revolutions came to the fore. He said, well, there is no way people organize that by themselves. I know the people. They are not able to do that. So you have to pick, on one, to pick up one of four communists behind the scenes, Zionists behind the scenes, Islamists or Salafists or whatever. 
So it, there is no way, no chance that people actually organize that. And what we have to just bear in mind is that these revolutions, in the point of departure, didn't deal, as Professor Rabinovich mentioned, with Israel. Disappointed youth, frustrated, suffering of unemployment and poverty, were being organized by those networking sites. And I can tell that because we are following these sites and we know where we're going to have the next, what they call in Arabic, day of anger. And you have a calendar above the head of the leaders where you know actually when you're going to get the next demonstration and where. And it goes on and on. And this is why I think we have to bear that in mind. Now, what you are right saying, and I accept that, this could be cynically used by parties like Muslim Brothers. I agree with that. But this is part of the whole game. Revolutions are not that organized. We know that. Not only in the Middle East. And we are through the process of the revolution or the dynamic of the revolution. And this is why I said before that, that what we got here is many orientations coming to the fore. And this is a period of instability. And we have to bear that in mind because this is something that would affect states and societies in the Middle East. And Israel, of course, should rethink about the Middle East because it is a different Middle East. And we have to respond also diplomatically, not only with Iron Fist. Iron Fist is very important. Israel should remain strong. No doubt about that. But Israel should be responsive to the changing Middle East. Diplomatically, and do a kind of a come up with some moves that would create not only the impression but the ability to see things in a different way. And if you would like, for example, to expose the problematic, uh, let us say, reconciliation agreement between Hamas and Fatah, you're going to do that by actually challenging challenging them, both of them, with kind of an agreement that would expose one way or the other the huge differences that we have between Hamas and Fatah. It's just, just a, a kind of a thought about that. Thank you. Thank you, Uzi. Allow me to conclude by making the following comment, uh, following comment made by uh, Itamar. Well, coming back to Egypt and the, the United States, once I think that the Americans realized or got to the conclusion that uh, Mubarak's days were numbered and that he actually lost this, this struggle for power and that uh, the winning side is the street or these demonstrators on the street, we saw the American joining forces with the win winning side, with the winners. In, uh, if we move to Egypt, once we uh, realized that uh, the rebels or the demonstrators took over at least part of Libya, and it seemed that, well, uh, Gaddafi is losing, well, immediately we saw the West and we saw the United States joining forces with the winning side, with the side which seemed to be the strong side in this struggle for power. In the case of Syria, well, maybe the demonstrators are courageous people who are ready to get out of the street and being shot and being killed by the regime. Maybe they do uh, demonstrate and fight for a moral cause, but that's not enough. They are the uh, weak side in this equation. And uh, still, the one who has control over Syria and is the strong and the winning side is uh, Bashar al-Assad. This is the lesson I think we should draw from this experience. You should always be strong. You should always be able to defend yourself. You should always uh, rely on yourself. And 
I'm happy to say that Israel is strong, and it is strong thanks to your uh, support uh, and thanks to institutions like the Tel Aviv uh, University. So by this uh, remark, I would like to conclude our panel to thank the panelists and to thank you all and uh, to wish to see you all uh, next year in the annual uh, Gendel Seminar. Thank you very much.